Thank you and good morning all from my COVID quarantine. Um, first of all, let me thank you for the invitation. I hope you can all hear me well. There's quite a lot of noise outside of our apartment building, apparently some work going on uh, in Pristina. Um, Ambassador Rode, uh, Mr. Quirrell, Ambassador Power, uh, respected representatives of um, our courts here in Kosovo. Uh, I was asked to speak in English, uh, so I hope it is okay uh, to uh, continue like this, respected representatives and panelists. Uh, let me perhaps begin by saying that I've been delivering quite a lot of speeches and presentations lately, especially since I was elected uh, Speaker of Parliament, but even more so now after taking the office of the president. And as you can imagine, some topics are more close to the heart than others. Some are more interesting or more looking forward than the others. Uh, but I was particularly looking forward to this conference since it takes me back to some very dear memories while I was on one hand working with the Council of Europe, training judges on the European Convention on Human Rights. And uh, on the other hand, I was teaching about the convention at the Faculty of Law together with many colleagues who have joined us here today in this conference. So it is truly a distinct pleasure to address you as we mark the 70th anniversary of the signing of the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms in Rome in 1950. Um, ever since the European Convention has managed to set out the fundamental rights we all need to be able to live a, a free and dignified life, hence becoming the cornerstone for the protection of human rights in our continent. While some consider the European Convention as being too progressive, other attack, others attack it for being quite the opposite. The fact is, however, that it is truly remarkable how in a few hundred words, this convention has managed to establish a blueprint for free, just, and democratic society where the right to life, the right to liberty, freedom of speech and expression, and other rights are guaranteed as universal and indivisible rights. And thus, it is this convention that has been rightfully considered the most successful system for the enforcement of human rights in the history of the world. Uh, while the convention and its case law have managed to construct an institutionalized and systematic approach towards the protection of human rights, the necessity to protect and stand up for these rights today is as important and as much of a priority as ever before. Um, hence today, as we evaluate its practical effects on the human rights, democracy and rule of law, we also reinstate our commitment to further promote and implement the human rights standards that are set forth by this convention and the respective case law that is based on it. And given our constantly evolving living conditions, it is truly remarkable that the convention has not remained frozen in time and we have especially seen that through the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, which is the guardian of this convention and managed to adopt to the circumstances. It is uh, very clear when we look at the case law from many years ago to today, how its interpretation has evolved. And as I said, uh, it has not remained frozen in time, but it adapted to the circumstances and to the new advancement in many areas uh, in, in uh, today's circumstances. So this contributed to the broadening of the scope of the rights guaranteed by the convention, taking into account societal, environmental, technological developments that were unpredictable back at the time of its adoption, yet with the raising tendencies to questions, the very basics of Europe's human rights framework, events and forums such as this one, which offer us an opportunity to reflect on what has been achieved and what needs to be prioritized on the road ahead. And these become even more important now. I believe these are very worrying times. We are witnessing increasingly open and direct demonstrations of intolerance, of violence, violations of basic human rights, enhanced sentiments of racism, hate crime, hate speech, terrorism and radicalization, expanded patterns of these violations, especially towards people who may look, believe, or dress differently. It is now clearly evident that in 2019, as in previous years, 
there has been growing challenges to human rights standards and principles all, all over the continent. And we're yet to see the reports coming from 2020, which as we can see here nationally, um, of course, there have been gross violations, especially when it comes to gender-based violence. Um, and of course, the pandemic has absolutely um, uh, had an effect on it, a negative effect, that is. So with these challenges on the side, on this 70th anniversary of the European Convention, it is worth taking a moment to appreciate how important this convention has been, and equally so, how important it remains today in protecting us from the worst instincts. And as we jointly confront these challenges, I pled that we remain driven by these values and premises that the convention was built upon respectfully, the protection of human rights and the rule of law and the promotion of democracy. So let me close by mentioning the importance of this convention in Kosovo. As you've rightly pointed out, we've made it directly applicable and we've made it as the heart of our legal system through Article 22 of the Constitution, where we've enumerated a number of international conventions that are directly applicable in our country. We've mentioned the applicability of these conventions in our Declaration of Independence, the very day when we de declared our country free, sovereign, and independent, because we understand that a country is successful only if it successfully protects human rights and freedoms. Moreover, although we're not a member of the Council of Europe, in our constitution through Article 53, we have cemented our commitment of every public institution to guaranteeing that human rights and fundamental freedoms are interpreted in line with the decisions and judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. But ladies and gentlemen, the mere fact that Kosovo is not being allowed to join the Council of Europe and thus use the European Court of Human Rights mechanism, I believe is a violation of human rights in itself. Our citizens are not being able to address their cases to Strasbourg if the violation is from an institution of their home country. In this case, they are being denied one of the most fundamental instruments in protecting human rights, which is access to justice and the judicial protection of rights. So while we're discussing here today on how important this convention has been for Europeans all across our continent, and also the example it has given for other continents, please bear in mind that we are Europeans too. And access to justice, access to the European Court of Human Rights should never be politicized. Therefore, I use this opportunity to ask for your support, to support Kosovo's membership to the Council of Europe, because this is not just a simple membership in an international organization. It is access to justice for every single Kosovar, for every single citizen of our country. So it is therefore about time that the Council of Europe opens its arms to Kosovo, because only in this way, we can be able to say that this organization is standing up for the values enshrined in the European Convention on Human Rights, because only then, we would be convinced that we are all working to live in a just, safe, and peaceful Europe, since we've ensured ultimate respect for equal rights for all of the citizens living in our continent. Thank you very much for this opportunity.